Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca King. I'm a member of the board of the Hypersomnia Foundation and happy to welcome you today to our first virtual event of 2021. The theme for today is your best self, new ways of thinking about disability and support. And we've got two excellent speakers to share their thoughts on these topics. Before we get to the speakers, let's say hello to our Hypersomnia Foundation Chair and CEO, Diane Powell, who will facilitate the Q&A sessions with each of our speakers. Thanks, Rebecca, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to start by thanking all of our donors. The generosity of our community, particularly in the midst of a pandemic, has been amazing. We're so appreciative. This program is also supported by our corporate sponsors, which include Harmony Biosciences, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and Takeda Pharmaceutical Company. The support of all of our donors and sponsors help make this program possible and allows us to offer it as a free event. We have a great program today, and here is a quick rundown of our schedule. In a moment, we will begin our first presentation about the emotional challenges many people experience when they consider whether their sleep disorder is a disability. Then we will take a short break and share a few announcements. Finally, we're going to learn about finding a support group. We are fortunate to have several vibrant support groups in our community already, but if you're considering forming a new one, we'll also talk about the nuts and bolts of starting your own support group. And with that, it's time for Diane to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Rebecca. Our first presenter is a top disability attorney in Atlanta, Georgia. She's also a board member of a Hypersomnia Foundation. She has uh, represented numerous clients with IH and related disorders, and she's presented for the Hypersomnia Foundation on the past, in the past on um, going through the disability process and how to manage the appeals process. But today she's going to take a slightly different approach. She's going to be sharing her experience of staying up close, the emotional challenges that our clients often confront when they decide to apply for disability or they start to think about applying for disability. Um, and she'll be offering some suggestions on how to cope with those. So I'm delighted to turn the program over to Angel Burgess. Thank you, Diane. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Over the past 10 years, I have been representing families in social security disability claims. One of the biggest challenges that we have to work through in going through this process is the emotional aspect of disability and being disabled. The emotional aspects have often had significant effects on my client's ability to seek and receive much needed help. I think that in taking a closer look into what drives the resistance to the words disabled or disability will help so many people to get the support that they need. My hope today is that this presentation will help all of you to embrace new ways of thinking about disability and support. So with that being said, I'd like to start off talking about the word disability. What does it mean? Well, that depends on who you ask and the purpose for which the word is to serve. If we look to Marion Webster Dictionary, um, a disability is defined as a physical, mental, cognitive, or developmental condition that impairs, interferes with, or limits a person's ability to engage in certain tasks or actions or participate in typical daily activities and interactions. If we look to the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, their definition is a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. And if we look to the Social Security Administration, their definition is much more specific. Um, and it states that a person who is unable to engage in any substantial gainful activity because of a medically determinable physical or mental impairment that is either expected to result in death or has lasted or is expected to last for at least one year. 
Now, the problem that I think that many people have with the word disability or themselves being disabled is that there is such a stigma associated with the words. A stigma is a mark of disgrace, which is associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. In my opinion, a st the stigma of disability exists primarily due to a combination of three flat factors or influences, uh, societal, emotional, and institutional influences or factors. I think that each of these factors has approximately an equal impact um, on the stigma and perpetuating the stigma of disability. When we look or think about societal factors, I think of the things that I see on TV or the things that I read about in the newspaper, um, such as uh, stories about people who have applied for disability. Um, in particular, I remember one story that I saw about a man who was receiving disability benefits for his back. And there was some footage of this individual um, on vacation. And it appeared as though he was hiking and he was pushing a very large rock. Um, and, and so kind of the basis of that story was, look at all the fraud that exists within the disability system. You know, this man is representative of so many other people that are gaming or cheating the system. We also hear rumblings of um, opinions such as, you know, there's so many people that are receiving disability that they're going to cause the entire system to go bankrupt. And it's because of all that fraud that none of us will get retirement benefits in 15 to 20 years. Those are the types of um, beliefs or thoughts that perpetuate the stigma of disability. There are also institutional, um, what I call them, or organizational or entities um, that even though they may provide people with benefits, in doing so, it's so difficult to get those benefits that there is a bit of mistrust going on, or there seems to be a lot of mistrust going on. That if I apply for disability, whether that's through the Social Security Administration, the Veterans Administration, um, long-term disability, a teacher's uh, disability program, any sort of disability program, there seems to be a general perception that the baseline is fraud and that we need to send private investigators uh, to follow people to see if they're really disabled. And we need to you know, scrutinize the things that people are doing because they're trying to, to defraud the system. And I think that those two, the societal and the institutional or organizational um, influences have a lot to do with how we personally perceive the words disability and disabled. So there's a big emotional factor that prevents people, in my opinion, from being able to get the support that they need. Now, over the years, I have talked to many clients. I've talked with um, people in the IH community about how they view disability and what it means to them to be disabled or hear the words disability. And I've heard a lot of um, really powerful things like, you know, feeling like you need to hide the symptoms from other people because you don't want anyone to know the things that you're going through. Feeling like disability is a label and you don't want that label to be placed upon you um, because you've worked very hard at accomplishing your goals and your symptoms have caused some interruption in the pursuit of those goals. I've had people to tell me that they felt that disability meant that they had to be dependent on someone else and that they did not want to depend on any other person 
or the government or a private insurance company um, to be able to sustain that. I've seen and, and heard people express um, feelings of grief associated with the loss of a former life, um, some depression associated with the fact that I am now at a place where I'm not able to do the things that I used to do. And I've also seen people express some denial. They said, yes, I've got this diagnosis um, of IH and it's affecting me greatly, but I am not disabled. You know, I'm, I'm not able to do the things that I need to do to get through a typical day on schedule, but I am not disabled because being disabled is bad. I've also um, had people come to the point of acceptance in realizing that yes, this is where I am, but I control the narrative from here on out and I can decide what disability means to me. Now, the problem with all of these influences um, in our lives, and, and that can also include friends and family members and their perspectives on disability, is that the stigma does more harm than good in many aspects. The stigma prevents us from seeking treatment. We don't want to go to the doctor because we don't want to you know, get a diagnosis for which there is no cure. We don't want to be disabled, so we won't get the treatment that we need. It prevents us from asking for help, and that's help from a spouse, from a family member, from a friend, because we feel that we need to hide the things that we are experiencing, um, particularly when the disability is an invisible one, that no one can tell just from looking at you what's going on. So oftentimes it's easier to hide what's going on and not ask for any help instead of acknowledging that you're having significant difficulties. The stigma also prevents us from collecting and retaining documents which prove that we are having problems or difficulties. I have so many clients and have had over the years that in the workplace or at school, their symptoms have been so disruptive that it has affected their performance. Um, and it has obviously perfect, affected their performance in that things start happening, like their grades start falling or they may start failing classes. Um, in the workplace, a supervisor may um, write you up. And those things are so devastating um, to us who are trying to work hard to accomplish our goals that sometimes our response is, I'm gonna take that letter and I'm throwing it in trash. I am ripping it up. I'm destroying any evidence of things that suggest that I can't do what I used to do. And while I certainly understand you know, the impact that the negative information has on you, in the long run, it could be those documents that are so helpful in getting the support that you need. The stigma also prevents us from requesting accommodations at school or in the workplace. And in doing so, it encourages us to throw in the towel, right? You're having trouble at work, you've been written up, you feel like you're going to be fired, so you just quit. You just say, I can't do this job anymore, and you quit. Or you're having trouble at school, your grades are falling, you are perhaps on academic probation, and you just withdraw. And oftentimes we do these things without first exploring other options or the use of accommodations. And accommodations may be such that they are helpful enough to us that it allows us to be able to accomplish our goals. The stigma also prevents people from filing for benefits that they need, um, such as short-term disability, 
long-term disability, and social security disability. So instead of applying for that for those benefits, if you just throw in the towel, not only are you causing a significant financial disruption to you and your family, but you may also lose your health insurance, which in turn prevents you from being able to go to the doctor and perhaps get the medications that you need to continue to support you. So what do we do with this? I think it's important to debunk the stigma. Look at things which prove to us that the society's um, opinions about disability and being disabled are largely unfounded. First, having a disability does not necessarily mean that you're not able to work. There are many people that have disabilities that are able to successfully work. So one does not equate to the other. The Social Security Administration has actually taken quite an interest um, in the areas of fraud um, and in looking to see what happens to people after they have um, received an unfavorable decision in a hearing. So the Social Security Administration has uh, taken a big look at fraud. And over the years, they have really um, focused on investigating fraud to see at what um, prevalence rate it exists as it relates to disability claims. And according to the Social Security Administration, the fraud incidence rate for disability claims is less than 1%. So, you know, that statistic alone lets me know that things that we see, like the story about the man pushing the big rock um, as he's hiking, that's an outlier. He is an outlier. He is not the norm. He is not the typical person that receives disability. And there is no actual evidence that fraud is anywhere near a problem in disability claims. Rather, the evidence shows that fraud is nearly non-existent. Furthermore, the Social Security Administration has conducted studies to see what happens to people who have been denied disability benefits. So typically, when you're going through the disability process, you're going to get a denial after your initial application, you'll appeal it and get another denial, and then you'll go in front of a judge and have a hearing. So in this particular study, Social Security was interested in a group of people who had been denied by a judge, and they wanted to see what happened to that same group of people four years later. And what this study showed us was that of the people that had been denied four years previously, almost 25% of them remained out of work four years later. So they never went back to work four years later, almost 25%. So you ask, okay, I mean, that's pretty significant, but what about the other 75%? Well, that's even more telling because of the remaining 75%, approximately 12.5% of the applicants had returned to work full-time. So they were able to get back into the workforce full-time, 12.5% of people four years later. Another 12.5% had returned to work but not in a capacity in which Social Security would consider to be substantial. So essentially they had returned to work in a part-time capacity. That's 12 and a half percent. Approximately 8% of those individuals were no longer eligible for benefits. And they were ineligible for reasons including death. Um, some had 
credits that had expired, so they weren't eligible for any benefits. Um, others had too much money in resources and weren't eligible for benefits. And others had reached full retirement age, so they weren't eligible for disability benefits. Now the remaining approximately 29% of those same applicants were receiving disability benefits four years later. And so what that means is that they had applied possibly reapplied after that judge's denial and had been approved, or they had gone through the appeals process, um, perhaps even up to the federal appellate level, and they had ultimately been approved, again, off the basis of that earlier denial. And then lastly, 13% had a pending claim. And so that means that they had either reapplied um, and were waiting for a decision, or they had appealed that last judge's denial and were waiting to see what happened in the appeals process. So really, four years later, more than half of the people um, who had been previously denied by a judge still were not able to work. That provides some support for my personal belief, which is that most people that apply for disability benefits apply because they need it. Not because they wanna take advantage of the system, but because they need it. And contrary to popular belief, you cannot get rich off of disability benefits. You know, the average person receives close to $1,300 per month in disability benefits. That's the average person. But it depends on whether you're receiving pro, uh, benefits based off your work history or you're receiving SSI. And for SSI, the, most people will receive up to about $794 per month. It's just no way to get rich off of receiving Social Security disability benefits. Now, the other thing that's important to know in debunking the stigma um, is that when you apply for disability, your application is private. So, so many people say to me, I don't want anybody else to know. I don't want my friends to know. I don't want my family members to know that I've applied for disability and I feel like I can't do this because I'm gonna be exposed. People are gonna know. And the fact of the matter is that's not correct. Your application is private. All matters pertaining to your claim are accessible to Social Security. And if you have an attorney, they're accessible to your attorney as well. I also think it's important to acknowledge the fact that the words disability and disabled do not define you. Rather, you decide what those words mean to you and you can take the necessary steps to get what you need, um, regardless as to what anybody else may think about disability and being disabled. Now, in turning our view to new ways of thinking about disability and support, I think it's important to talk about the things that we protect. So, most of us who have cars, and hopefully all of us who have cars, have insurance, right? And that insurance is to protect our cars um, in the event that something happens to them, right? We want them to be repaired and or replaced if necessary. We protect our home um, in the event that something happens to it so that we can get the necessary repairs or rebuild or replace as necessary. We even protect our furniture, right? I don't want my dining room table to get scratches all over it and I have to live with the scratches. So I'm gonna pay for that protection plan so that it can be repaired as necessary. And we certainly protect our cell phones. We don't want those screens to be cracked. Um, we don't want anything to be damaged that would require us to buy a new phone. And it's almost like we protect these things 
in a manner that's effortless, right? We don't think too hard about whether we need to protect them. We just know that we do. But when it comes to ourselves and protecting ourselves, that's when we tend to say, you know what, it's not necessary or it's too expensive to have that additional, you know, $50 a month taken out of my paycheck to pay for long-term disability. We tend to put ourselves on the back burner while we protect everything else. And in our new way of thinking about disability, our focus is on us. Becoming your best advocate. And that means pursuing treatment options, going from doctor to doctor until you find what works best for you, until you find a diagnosis that both you and the doctor agree applies to you and your symptoms. That means learning about disability programs and protecting your greatest asset, which is you, making sure that if anything would happen that interrupts your work, your ability to work, or if you're in school, that you have a backup plan there to protect you. It means keeping records, even if the things contained in those records are unpleasant or hurtful to you, you have to keep up with records that show that you've been absent, that you're missing too much work or school, that your grades have declined, or that you may be failing, um, evaluations that show that there have been performance issues or write-ups. You need to keep copies of those things. Just put them in a folder and stick them in a drawer. And one day, if you ever need them, you will be so glad that you advocated for yourself enough to keep that information. Ask for what you need to become your best self. And what I mean by that is, if you are in school or if you are working, ask for what you need to allow you to continue to perform. If you need extra time taking tests, ask for it. If you need additional support, if you need um, extended deadlines, ask for those things. If you are at work and you need more frequent breaks, ask for it. If you need, um, you know, deadlines that are not as, as tight, ask for those things. Because the only way that you are going to be able to utilize the accommodations that you are entitled to is if you ask for them. Apply for the benefits that you need, no matter what anybody else thinks, family members, friends, the community, don't worry about anybody else's opinion. Ask for what you need. Apply for the benefits that you need. Do what's best for you. And in doing so, even though it's hard to say, yes, I'm disabled, or yes, I need these benefits, reset your expectations and say, I'm going to take you know, the things that I am able to do, and I'm going to change the way that I do them so that it suits me. I'm going to find my purpose and do what's meaningful to me. Most importantly, know that you are not alone. Seek advice from other people that have similar experiences. I can assure you that you are not the first person that has experienced the things that you have or been in your shoes. So talk to other people. You will find that it is so helpful and you will get so many helpful suggestions that will allow you to get what you need. Join or form a support group. And there's a fantastic presentation coming up um, about this topic. So I'm not going to say anything other than utilize a support group, which is an incredibly valuable resource. And most importantly, help someone else. And helping someone else that is on this journey it is going to help you even more. I would like to share a quote um, with you all from a phenomenal young woman by the name of Lauren Crane. And Ms. Crane has um, done a great job in sharing her thoughts and her journey um, as she 
has been diagnosed uh, with a sleep disorder and is, is dealing with and making adjustments in her life um, with this knowledge. Ms. Crane says, but at some point I got tired of crying and I embraced this part of me. I joined the disability community on Twitter and started talking to more people with my sleep disorder. Sharing my experiences led me to find communities that I felt I belonged to. Um, yes, yeah, thank you, Angela. That's a tremendous presentation. And I think this is something that hasn't been talked about very much from, from how you're, you've described it. It sounds like the, the, the process itself with the denials and refiling the denials again is already emotional. And so having to deal with that, you know, your own self and how you feel about it is really important. And I've been jotting down some questions here. We have a viewer who'd like to know, how can family members and friends help support someone who is going through the process of applying for disability? I think family members are, it can be the most valuable resource um, in providing that encouragement. And, you know, most of the clients that I have that have struggled with applying for disability and being disabled have come because they've been encouraged or gently nudged by a family member that this is what you need. You know, this is, you need to have some financial support. You can have independence still. You need to be able to continue to have your health insurance and get your medications. Um, so we support you and we think that this is going to help you. Right, right. Um, I was really struck too, and some of our viewers are as well, about the statistics of how low the fraud rate is. Um, and I do think that's how a lot of us have been you know, given that impression because of course, uh, for a news story, they're going to look for that outlier. That's right. um, how can all of us generally uh, help get past the, the stigma in society about disabilities? I think that a, a really good way to help get past the stigma um, is not to hide the things that you're experiencing. As you are helping other people with similar experiences, then you know, their families are then brought into it. Their families are given a better understanding of, okay, I, don't, I didn't really understand what it means to be disabled, but now I know. You know, I thought disabled meant that you couldn't get out of the bed or that, you know, you couldn't walk. And there's so many misconceptions about what it actually means to be disabled that as we bring more people kind of into the circle, that circle expands greatly. And then there's a, a much better understanding um, amongst society that disability, number one, is not a bad thing, but disability is right. not what we thought that it was that you can be disabled in many different ways. Right, and I don't know if it's the term still being used. I know for a while it was that people were using the term differently abled to sort of get away from the negative of that disabled, mm -hmm. differently abled and what they can do. Um, we also have a viewer who's asking if, if you have ideas for how people can find a, maybe a career coach or do you think that's a good idea to try to find something that they can do? I know it's not really your area, but have you seen clients do that? Yes, actually, um, each state has um, vocational rehabilitation services, um, which are available. And uh, vocational rehabilitation is available through your state's Department of Labor. And the focus with vocational rehabilitation is to help people to find jobs that suit whatever needs that they may have. So typically they're working with people with disabilities to help them find jobs that will accommodate their disabilities. There are also private um, job coaches. There are also private groups that focus on helping people to build the necessary skills or just to find a job that mm -hmm. complements their needs. Right. So I would start with the state's Department of Labor, um, wherever you live, to see what they can do to assist you. Great. 
Um, we're running short on time, so I'm going to see if I can put the last question sort of into a nutshell. First of all, there's a lot of people who would like to know how to contact you. Uh, there are a lot of people asking, uh, or some people asking some very specific questions about disability, and I just want to mention that everyone who's viewing today will get an email from us today that will have a link to a number of things, and one of them will be previous presentations that um, Angel has given on the nuts and bolts of applying for disability and going through the process. And um, Angel, it sounds like we need to bring you back because that's something that people always have questions about and want to know more about. Sure. Um, and let's see, I'm just taking a look. And there was just a, a, a quick question about whether you think the pandemic has affected the filing for disabilities. Not exactly talking about the emotional aspect, but, but if you could sure. just address that briefly and then wrap Absolutely. up for us. Um, yes, the pandemic has affected the uh, application process for disability in a couple of ways. Um, hearing offices are closed to the public. Um, to protect the public and the judges and, and staff. So what Social Security has done to try to keep things moving is they've been uh, holding hearings by telephone. They have also recently introduced a video hearing option so that you can have a something, something similar to a Zoom type of hearing. Um, so those are the two options right now are the telephone and video hearings, but they are continuing to, to process claims. Um, everybody's working from home, so things aren't moving as quickly as they normally do, but just please be patient with it and know that they are going to get to you. Great, thank you. And now we'll, we'll, let, you, we'll let you wrap up. Thank you so much, it's been wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Diane. Um, in closing, I would like to share a quote with you all from uh, Rebecca Tossig in her book, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary, Resilient, Disabled Body. And Ms. Tossig says, the goal is not to avoid falling or needing help. The goal is to be seen, asked, heard, believed, valued as we are, allowed to exist in these exact bodies, invited to the party, and encouraged to dance however we want to. Thank you, Angel, for so thoughtfully addressing this issue. So during the break, we will be sharing the link to our website where you can find um, more videos by Angel, and she's got a couple of previous presentations on the disability application and appeals process. So if you're interested, please go ahead and go there. So now it's time for the break, and we'll see you shortly. Hello again. Before we meet our final speaker, I have a couple of announcements. 
Last fall, a few members of our community started a Facebook discussion on the idea of forming a team to raise money for hypersomnia research. These community members connected with the Hypersomnia Foundation and were working together to form a bike team dubbed the Sleep Wake Cyclers. Anyone who rides any sort of cycle is welcome to join the team, whether you're riding a big wheel or a 10 speed or a Peloton or a Harley. On Saturday, June 12th, all riders will hit the road on the course of their own choosing. Whether you choose to pedal around the block or across the country, we'd love to have you join in the fun. At this time, we're recruiting riders to join our virtual team. Each rider is asked to raise a minimum of $1,000. For our first year, our goal is to find 20 riser, riders and raise $20,000, but we think there may be more than 20 people willing to ride for research. If you are one of those people who would like to do something to help us get the idiopathic out of IH, I am the person to contact. You can email me at Rebecca at hypersomniafoundation.org. If you haven't got a pen handy right now, you'll be receiving an email after the webinar with several links to topics covered today, including links to the Sleep Wake Cyclers webpage where you will find my email address. Another way to find more information is to go to the Hypersomnia foundation.org website and search on the word bike. If you happen to have just found a pen, my email address once again is Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A at hypersomniafoundation.org. We're also excited to share the news that we are taking our first steps to meaningfully expand the Hypersomnia Foundation activities beyond the US. We'd like to announce that one of our volunteers Francis Smaldridge has been named as our UK liaison. In that role, Francis will research the UK's National Health Service so that we can compile and share information on the processes and resources available for people with IH and related disorders in the United Kingdom. Francis is a medical student who has IH herself and is eager to advocate for others with rare sleep disorders. She is watching us today from the UK and will be joining us in a future program. Thank you, Francis, for volunteering to take on this position. We're gonna go back to our program now. Our next presenter is a co-founder of the popular Snooze Cruise Retreat for people with rare sleep disorders and their friends and families. Through her group, the Hypersomnia Alliance, she also founded and facilitates a support group and she advises other people on how to start a support group, which was what brings her here with us today. Many of you already know her as a strong advocate for people with IH, and I am uh, excited to welcome Diana Kimmel. Hi, Diane. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about support groups and why they're important. When you were introducing me, what really came to mind was, how did I become that person that was diagnosed to the person who started running a support group, a snooze cruise retreat with some friends, um, and actually Hypersomnia Alliance, which helps other people find uh, support groups, uh, maybe just somebody else to talk to, or maybe help them find a doctor on one of the, um, the resources that you had. For me, when I was first diagnosed, I felt very alone. Um, I went through so many doctor's offices, um, basically being told, lose weight, there's nothing wrong. When I finally got the diagnose, diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia, I almost just felt worse. I thought I was gonna feel better, but I felt worse. Especially when my doctor said to me, don't go home and Google this, you'll find nothing and you'll get upset. So I went right home and I Googled it and I got upset. And I found there was no pamphlets, no support groups, nothing. I finally got around to finding some Facebook groups that had a little bit. What I really knew I needed was people. So this quote really resonates with me a lot. When I was doing this presentation, I heard it on the background of the TV. And when you're scared and insecure, that's when you need your people the most. And I really thought about it. And that's what sent me looking for other people that had hypersomnia. And when I talked to them, I knew they knew what I was saying. And I basically 
could relate. Like many people, my traditional support network was family, friends, and my doctors. Family and friends, like Angel Burgess just mentioned, we really tried to hide it from them. Um, we didn't want the stigma. Now I'm diagnosed, now I wanna talk about it openly, and they're really not understanding how I'm feeling. I mean, at that point, I wasn't feeling, really understanding how I was feeling. My doctors did a great job as far as helping me through the medical journey of IH, but they could only do so much and they certainly couldn't build me a community. Um, and that's where I really realized I had to get out there and find it myself. And watching other people, maybe with diabetes or cancer, there were support groups. And I thought to myself, well, that's gotta work. You're gonna meet people that know what you're going through, feel the same way, have the same struggles, and maybe find out the coping skills. What I found with support groups is a place of accepting and understanding, whether it's you've met one person that has hypersomnia or you're in a group of 10, all of a sudden you just almost feel relaxed at home. One person in my support group, when I was talking to her about what I was gonna say during this program, she said to me, it's really easy. It's an intimate experience where I instantly felt warmly accepted and supported. I mean, it doesn't get any better from that when we're so used to living in a world where we're trying to explain why we did something, why we said something. I find also in support groups that I'll talk about a struggle that I'm having and what strategies, what coping skills work for me, and then we feed off of each other. And before I know it, we're all supporting each other. And I'm learning, they're learning, and we go home with new ideas. Information as a whole with IH, that has been something that's been hard to keep up with. When I was diagnosed eight or nine years ago, there wasn't much out there. So now that there's a foundation, there's medical clinical trials going on, support groups help each other stay informed and included. Advocacy, certainly part of going to a support group, even if you're not the facilitator of the support group, you learn how to finally communicate, um, reach out to others for help, support others. Before you know it, you're even advocating for yourself at a more efficient rate with your doctors, uh, your lawyers, and your family members. For me, I hear this a lot about the layer of validity. Um, so many people look at me and they're say, well, you're not, you don't look disabled. And I feel like I'm constantly trying to explain what my disability is. So when I'm amongst people that have the same disability, I really feel like I'm understood. So we can talk about why support groups are important. And now let's, where do you find them? So there's different types. We all know that there's a Facebook social media out there and it works for quite a bit of people, but there's a lot of people who don't have social media. We have face-to-face -face meetings, video meetings, there's conference and educational events and retreats. Facebook and social media, it's a great way to have constant everyday feedback, but it only goes so far. It's less personal. Um, you don't get feedback as quickly um, and you don't really get that um, back and forth personal feeling. Which brings me to face-to-face -face and video meetings. COVID-19 obviously has really brought video meetings uh, as more of a popular way of meeting. Face-to-face -face obviously right now is not working for any of us. Um, so what's the pros and cons? Face-to-face -face meetings. They're definitely a more of an intimate and safe environment. They have a more of a supportive energy. You get to sit down with those people. You get to feed off each other. You have times where you can break off and talk to somebody that maybe they said something that really resonated with you. 
and you have that time to be with them. We also have found in our face-to-face -face meetings, especially here in Atlanta, sometimes we have a great hour, hour and 20 minute meeting, but then we go out and maybe have a cup of coffee or a meal together. And all of a sudden, I found that in that relaxed setting, people really open up. Whether it's the person with hypersomnia, whether it's a supporter, there just seems to be more of an openness that flows. So they, there's definitely a lot of more energy that comes from there. The obvious cons are travel and transportation. A lot of us with IH don't feel comfortable driving, don't drive at all. So that's, that's a barrier. Um, proximity, you're really only going to get people to come to your meetings that is within a uh, reasonable driving area. And COVID-19 has definitely put a stop to the face-to-face. -face. Uh, my Atlanta support group meeting has been running for about five years. We have a great group of people and it really has been hard to let go of that. Um, it's a place where once a month, I know that I can go and feel totally at home. I could, a lot of us say that when we're with people who don't have IH, we feel like we're always kind of on, meaning we're always watching everything that we do and watching how clumsy we are. And if we forgot a word, if we fell asleep, um, that's, that's something that a face-to-face -face meeting, you just feel comfortably all the time. So video meetings. I've been kind of excited to see videos um, pop up because it's definitely a more accessible meeting. I did find getting ready for this. I always thought that I didn't like speaking in front of people in an audience. I think I find this actually a little harder. So that's definitely a con, but they're very convenient. Most people have a computer, they have internet and they can dial in. So you're definitely gonna get the accessibility for that. A broad net, you're gonna get a lot of people from different areas, which is great. You don't get that in a face-to-face -face meeting because again, you have to travel there, there's costs involved and things like that. One thing I'm finding with the video meetings that is different than a face-to-face -face is you miss the cues, um, you don't, really sometimes get the tact and the tone. Sometimes it's a little just colder and uncomfortable. So that for me um, is definitely a, a con, a broad net. Now that was a pro and it's also a con because you're getting people from all over. I know that there's some meetings that have been popping up that are US based or um, Canada based that, but you're gonna get everybody from the United States. I think those are great meetings. I, really hope that they grow and maybe get to the point where um, they break off into smaller meetings. Um, and then you can get a, maybe at some point in time, those smaller meetings can break off into a face-to-face. -face. And I definitely talked about the, the less personal. Um, hopefully the facilitators of an online group are helping their members connect outside of it to get that personal touch. What I know for me is, I can tell you all the reasons in my life that IH has negatively affected. And there's a lot of them. But one thing I've always said is the best part of IH, and probably the only best part of IH, is the people that is brought into my life because of it. I would have never met these people. I would have never talked to these people. I would have never sat in a meeting. I would have never gone to a conference with them. And I would have never vacationed with them. So it's... I always say it's magical when you meet that first person that totally gets it. And they, they can see in me what they feel and vice versa. And there's just an automatic connection. So I, I really, and if there's anything I can do to help, and if you're thinking about starting your own meeting, I would love to help because the more meetings that we can get going on the video end of it, that hopefully once COVID-19 slows down, we can start popping up some more solid in-person ones. And I've always said, you know, if, you, if you're looking for something and you can't find it, you have my email address, let me see if I can help you and or connect you with somebody who is doing something. 
Okay, so here's my favorite, conference, events, and retreats. This one, um, my first person I ever met with hypersomnia was at a, a sleep illness con uh, conference. Obviously, again, they're not really happening right now. So, um, and a lot of people are saying, I can't get to a conference because of travel, money, and I, I get that, I really do. But if you have a chance, when they do start up, you get to meet people, you get to spend time with people, you get to speak to doctors and researchers, they are just immeasurable. If you can get to one, keep your eye out, see what you can do. Events, what you're looking at here is one of the snooze cruises that uh, I co-found and run with Jennifer Beard. We do a snooze cruise retreat and that gives basically, I call it a support vacation. Um, and we spend a lot of time, we do breakout sessions, and um, some social events, excursions, you have some time by yourself, it's safe enough. Now everybody's saying, wait a minute, COVID, we're not, we're not cruising right now. We know that we have put our 2021 cruise off until 2022. We are holding our breath and wishing that uh, this happens and we can continue that snooze cruise tradition. So now I've basically told you all the amazing things the support group can give you, what you're gonna get out of it, what you can give. Um, so this morning when I was really finalizing this presentation, I was on Facebook, of course, and checking out my, my support groups and a little meme showed up and it was a Zen proverb. And it was, it said, a student says, I am very discouraged, what should I do? And the master said, encourage others. And that really resonated with me this morning because whether you're attending a support group or you're running a support group, you're going to be encouraging others. So you can't find a support group in your area or you want a specialized support group. So you're saying, what do I do? First and foremost, really make sure that there's nothing going on in your area. Again, that's something I started Hypersomnia Alliance with some other people to help others find those resources. We kind of know a lot of the meetings that are going on, some people who meet personally, some other groups that um, invite people with hypersomnia into their group. So at the end of this, I know that Diane mentioned she'll give the link as well. You can feel free to email me, um, go to our website, look at uh, other support groups at hypersomnians, hypersomniansalliance.com. And that will help you. If you still have not found something and you would like to start your own, I can't speak enough about it because in your journey of setting up a meeting, you just continuously raise your level of support that you're receiving as well. So, and also don't get, don't, I don't want anybody feeling like, wait a minute, I can't just start my own meeting. It's, it's not as hard as you think. So let's talk about it. Setting up a meeting. So we have our two types. We have a face-to-face -face or a virtual. On both of those meeting types, you pretty much have to find a location of some sort. For a face-to-face -face location, in what I have found personally in talking to other people, libraries, doctor's office sometimes will let you use their waiting room or a conference room. Uh, hospitals also have a community room, community centers. You can find some place. I know some groups even pop up into a restaurant every now and then, um, wherever you can do. And also remember, I've always said this, two people make a support group. Two people sharing their experiences and supporting each other is a support group. So a virtual meeting. Um, I am not the techiest person, so I won't go down to the list of them, but there are platforms to run meetings. Try to pick something that is accessible, easily accessible to most people and easy to use. So now that you've figured out whether you wanna have a face-to-face -face or a virtual, how do you get those members? I'm gonna refer back to Facebook because that is a very wide net that you can catch. Um, you can go into some of the groups, talk about that you wanna open a meeting um, and start getting people in your area. Or 
if it's a special need, like you're a parent who wants to have an online parent support group for parenting your child with hypersomnia, or if you're a parent, vice versa. You can reach out to those members that way. There's also talk to your doctors and let them talk to people. Maybe you can get make a, have a card made up, have your doctors hand them out. There's the Meet Up app that you can set up a group and people can find you that way. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways. A flyer up at your doctor's office, uh, your sleep doctor's office always helps as well. Okay, so now we know what we wanna do. We know who's coming, picking a date. This one is not as actually easy as you think. Um, so give it some thought. Is our daytimes better, nighttimes better, is weekends, weekday nights? Um, think about your, your area. And another thing I really had to take in consideration is if I'm gonna do the weekends, staying away from holidays and things like that. But that ties into my next thing, which is consistency. Try to find a date that you can consistently. So like I do the second Saturday of every month. And so I don't have to come up with a date uh, or a number date. It's just the second Saturday of every month. Don't go it alone. You'll probably have heard me say we a lot. Um, and that's because I have hypersomnia. So knowing what I can do at a certain time doesn't always work for me. So I have found that a buddy system, a support system say works best, whether it's your super supporter at home that helps you, whether it's another person with IH and you're tag teaming with, um, don't go it alone. Have somebody that can have your back, have a backup person. Um, you have to give yourself a break. So now you've got this meeting, whether you're online, whether you're meeting face-to-face, -face, now how do you run it? What do you do? Um, the most important thing I found is respect. So what happens in a group should stay in a group. Now we're all gonna go home sometimes and talk to our supporter or our supporter is gonna go home and talk to their person with IH and say, listen to what they're doing or what their strategy is or what happened to them. Just trying to keep their personal information out of it, um, names, things like that. Um, basically the good old treat people like you wanna be treated. So this next one is no medical advice. I kind of have to laugh at this a little bit because when I wrote this slide up originally, I put it twice because it's that important, I guess. I cleaned it up and took one out, but no medical advice. Um, you can share your experiences, your journeys, your medications, what's worked, what doesn't, um, side effects, but always, always, always try to start every meeting and remind people that before they try medicine, that they always check with their doctors, whether it's over the counter or prescription. Very, very important. No judgment. This is something that um, I kind of often have to remind myself that there is no cookie cutter IH. So somebody might have a coping skill that works for them. Maybe they're a long sleeper, maybe you're a short sleeper. Try to hold back the judgment of your IH is not my IH and just really create that soft place to land um, of the support group that everybody wants to be a part of. Um, being kind and respectful, that kind of goes with a no judgment, um, but just, you know, the kindness of if it's your, if it's somebody's first meeting and you've been there, we all remember what it's like meeting somebody because it's, it's um, as exciting as it is, it's also scary. So if you just extend a little kind and respectfulness, it goes a long way. And boundaries. Um, When I first started advocating and running a support group meeting, I wanted to help everybody. And one thing I had to really learn is I can't. I can't solve everybody's problem. I can't fix every situation. And even if you're just a person in a support group, you can't. Um, so you do have to set some boundaries. You have to do some self-care. And you know, remember to definitely be kind to yourself and, and don't over overburden yourself with trying to do too much because then, that, that whole support group setting is no longer a soft place for you. Allow everyone a voice. Um, you know, it's sometimes when you get uh, a few people in a meeting, you know, sometimes eight, 10, and I can see this happening with maybe a Zoom call, everybody having that chance to talk. 
I've had different ways of doing that. Some people say they do timers. Some people say they do, um, they hold something and they pass it on to the next person to talk. And if you don't have it, um, sometimes it's a problem, sometimes it's not. But just remember that if you see somebody that looks like they want to keep talking, you know, maybe, you know, give them an opportunity or make that opportunity for them. Decide, deciding whether to do open discussion, set topic or speaker. This is something I toggle with over the five years that I've been doing it. Sometimes we just go in open discussion. Sometimes I just, you know, we talk about whatever is really, you know, prominent in somebody's life that's happening at that time. And there is times where I do bring in speakers. Um, this is just personal choice and what best fits the group that you, uh, you've created. Um, different views. Um, just like uh, anything, even my relationship with the Hypersomnia Foundation, I have a great relationship with them. They support us. Um, Hypersomnia Alliance supports them. I always remind everybody that all of views aren't exactly the same, and you know to take that into consideration when uh, when you're talking and when you're listening. So, like I said, I started this and I had a lot of help. So if you're out there and you're trying to find a support group, you're thinking about starting one, please reach out to me. Um, please understand I also have hypersomnia. It may take me a minute or so to get back to you, but I would love to help you get to that next level. Um, one of the things that I said early on was we grow when we support each other. So feel free to reach out to me. And Diane, thank you so much for letting me talk to everybody about support groups and, and how they help me. Well, this has just been tremendous, Diana. Thank you. It's a really wonderful presentation. Um, a lot of great information. I just uh, want to put a shout out there towards a uh, face to face. I know we're so fortunate to have this technology right now, but um, just thinking about the live events that we've done, um, as you know, the night before we start a conference, we have um, just a get together for people mm -hmm. to have a drink and just to, just to talk to one another, kind of a reception. And it's always one of my favorite parts of any event. It's all the side conversations. It's meeting the people that maybe I've gotten emails from or talked to in some other way. Um, meeting face to face, I just don't think technology can ever really replace it. Yeah. But um, let me get into some questions that we have. Um, uh, is, do you think, is there an optimal number of people for a support group? And is that different between video and in person? Is there a limit you, you advise? You know, video, it definitely is going to get difficult if you get too many and you don't have to have more of a topic conversation or a lead speaker. Um, support group meetings, I've had them up to, you know, 12 to 15 people at a time. Sometimes it's, it's, it's definitely the, the lesser amount of people. Um, some of my best meetings have been just a couple people of us. And sometimes when we get larger, we will, we will break off maybe and put one section and, uh, and people with hypersomnia in another section. Yeah, right. Has it been difficult? I don't know what, what happens in the group, stays in the group, but just, just generally, if you could describe it, has been difficult for your group to pivot from being in person to online or just the fact that you had that previous relationship? Made uh, it not such a, yeah. it's, it's actually, it's been hard because we did have that. We have a very close personal relationship. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so when, when we do actually get on Zoom together, everybody wants to talk and everybody's so excited. And, and, and you know, I've, I've probably not had as many Zoom meetings as well. So thank you for the, the gentle reminder that it's really important and, and we're gonna step over. That's great. Um, we have had um, people asking about supporters. Do supporters attend your group? Should, should supporters be included in a support group? Um, the way I've always done it was we invite people with hypersomnia, uh, narcolepsy, and the people who love them. And it's always worked out really well. I, um, I call it the supporters now. Sometimes they learn so much. Um, and I, somebody will say something and the supporter will be like, wait a minute, well, that's happening at our home too. So I have found it to be a really great experience to have the both of them. Um, yeah. There's been a couple of times, like I said, where we've broken off, whether it's because of numbers 
or maybe some supporters really needed to be off by themselves for a little while and, and have that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do, I, I welcome it. Yeah. Our last face to face, uh, our last in-person meeting in Baltimore, we did a breakout session and we had two groups. We had one for people with rare sleep disorders and another one for the families. And I facilitated the ones with families. And I thought it was really good for the family and friends to have time to talk about it because sometimes they don't want to share their worry, grief yes. they might feel for their person with IH. Yes. So um, there, I can see that for a separate meeting for supporters sometimes could be a good thing. And we're looking forward to getting back to that. Um, what do you think? Is, sorry, go ahead. We definitely do that on snooze cruise. We get them off. Um, right. We can because I, I know they want to talk about how awesome we are and easy to live with, and um, but they do they do need that time and they learn a lot from each other. Yeah, they do. And even um, my family member with IH uh, noticed that uh, after I attended the first HF event, she said before that you were concerned, but after you went to an HF conference, this is before it's on the board or any part of HF, she said you were like a mama bear because I got it, I got it. And I've seen that happen with other families as well. So I think support groups, the snooze crews, um, all these things can help supporters really understand, you know, what the issues are in a yeah. way that they might not otherwise get. Um, and lastly, we're wondering, um, is there something that the most, the most effective support groups, is there something that they all kind of have in common? Uh, consistency and communication. Um, so just, you know, one of the things when we first started, um, I started slow. I think I did three meetings a year. And then I switched to every month and made the determination with my support group that was helping me run these support groups that we would have, we would hold a support group meeting no matter what. Like I said, two people make a support group meeting. So we would go there no matter what. And we built up that consistency and that that reliability that we were going to be there. And that's when I started to see our, our, our group strength grow. It was really just the consistency. Consistency. Okay. And a lot of people, of course, have been asking about your, uh, your group, about Hypersomnia Alliance, how to get in touch with you, and, and whether or not there are video groups in the list on your website. I don't know if you know offhand, but uh, just to, again, to reassure people that we will be sharing the resources from today's meeting and the website Hypersomnia Alliance, including the link directly to your list of support groups. Uh, and I did think of one other thing, Diana, when you're trying to set up a time for someone, if you're doing it by video, you, people have to think about time zone. As someone in California, <laughs> I'm very familiar with this. People setting a 9 a.m. meeting, which is 6 a.m. my time. You know, it's just a, that would be something else to consider, obviously. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, exactly. Um, do you have any parting words of advice for us? I think it's really just um, the best thing you can do is, is really get involved because you're helping others. You're helping yourself. I mean, people ask me all the time, where do you get your support? And it's, I get that from you from the people that come to my support group meetings. Um, it helps me immeasurably. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. We'll, um, we'll go back to you. Thanks again, Diana. Thanks so much. Thank you again, Diana, for your excellent presentation and for your leadership of the Hypersomnia Alliance. And a shout out to Diane for helping us get answers to all the questions from our audience. If you enjoyed today's presentation, please consider supporting the Hypersomnia Foundation so we can continue our work. To do so, go to the hypersomniafoundation.org and click on the donate button. On behalf of the Hypersomnia Foundation, our thanks to all of you for joining us. Stay safe, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.